morning. I'm Alicia Lieberman, and it's a great pleasure to have Dr. John Luby this morning as our grand round speaker. I promise you that she's well worth braving the weather to be here. Um, she will be addressing the important topic of the mechanisms underlying the impact of early adversity and nurturance on early childhood brain development and the evidence for sensitive periods in this process. She is the Samuel and May S. Ludwig Professor of Psychiatry at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis, and she founded and directs the Early Emotional Development Program there. The importance of Dr. Luby's work cannot be overstated. Ten years ago, preschool mental health was still a rare and you can say boutique specialty with little influence on the rest of child and adolescent psychiatry. And today, thanks in no small part to Dr. Luby's rigorous research and many contributions, mental health in early childhood is, er is widely understood as one of the primary foundations to understand the etiology and course of psychiatric conditions during the entire life cycle. She pioneered the study of mood disorders in preschools and particularly depression at a time when there was widespread skepticism in the field that preschoolers could be depressed in the absence of major loss or other traumatic uh, events. Her longitudinal studies have established the remarkable similarities between the neurobiological profile of early onset depression and adult depression, as well as the similarity between somatic and behavioral characteristics of the disorder when adult systems are trans symptoms are translated into developmentally appropriate uh, indices for preschoolers. The early identification of depression that her work points to can transform the practice of child and adolescent psychiatry and psychology because the greater neuroplasticity of young children increases the possibility of effective intervention, early intervention that can then transform the course of the disease. In addition, her findings that poverty in early childhood has significant effects on brain development at school age and that these effects are mediated by stressful life events and by the quality of caregiving suggests that children relationships need to be an important component of early intervention and moreover have important implications for public policy as we strive to reduce the level, the amazingly the dramatic uh, prevalence of poverty in, um, in young children. It's not surprising that Dr. Luby's contributions have been widely recognized nationally and internationally. She has many, many awards. Uh, among them, the NARSA Gerald Clerman Award for Outstanding Research and the AACAP Irving Phillips Award for Prevention. And she is on the NIMH Board of Scientific Counselors. Without further ado, very welcome, John. Thank you for being here. Thanks so much. It's such a pleasure and honor to be here. And of course, I'm sure you know that um, Alicia Lieberman's program in infant mental health was really kind of the, the first one that started this whole movement going many, many, probably 40 years ago at this point. Um, uh, so it's great to come back to the Bay Area. I actually left the Bay Area in 1990 when I finished my training at Stanford and moved to St. Louis. Um, and my friends at the time said, are you crazy? Why are you doing this? Why are you going there? Um, and it was sort of an accidental place for me to go because it was not a place that a developmental psychopathologist would have been interested in going. There was really no developmental work going on there at the time. It was an intensely biological department that had lots, you know, with genetics was a huge, huge thrust. Of course, neuroscience is a huge, huge thrust. Um, and when I got there, 
um, even though the chair who had recruited us was interested in sort of giving me wide latitude in starting a program, the department, generally speaking, thought that the whole area of infant psychiatry was very silly, um, and they didn't really know, you know, they thought it was soft, and they thought that the idea of looking at parent-child relationships was, you know, not very hefty and, and not robust or valid. Um, and suffice it to say that I hope this is a story of the coming together of the psychosocial and the biological um, into one cohesive story, and that this actually is what may lead us to really finding some impactful interventions in mental health. So this is just my disclosure slide. And then just to talk about some of the basic principles um, of today's talk. So, of course, we all know that genetic drivers are an important element in what uh, moves brain development, but we've actually known for several decades that the psychosocial environment and the physical environment is also a very, very important ingredient in brain development. We know that adversity, stress, as well as nurturance and stimulation impact early brain development. Um, something else I'm going to touch on today, which is an entirely new area of research, and particularly in mental health, and for me, is the gut microbiome, which is a new frontier which may tell us a little bit about the physical environment and its impact on brain development, and may be one mechanism by which adversity impacts brain development. Um, the other thing that is so compelling about early childhood mental health, um, as Alicia just mentioned, is the the idea of sensitive periods, so periods in brain development when the brain is particularly susceptible to the influences of the environment, and that this could really represent a window of opportunity for treatment. Um, if we were growing vegetables, we would be all over sensitive periods, and you know, when we're growing humans, I think we really need to think about this as well. So, uh, as I mentioned, from animal research, we've known for quite some time, really since the 80s, that the environment in which a young organism is reared has a material impact on its neurogenesis and brain development. And these are experiments that have been done and replicated many, many times where laboratory mice have been reared in varying types of deprivation or stimulation and have shown that those reared in very stimulating environments have much better neurogenesis, larger hippocampi, and then better cognitive outcomes. So underscoring the importance importance of a rich, stimulating, and nurturing environment early in development. Um, we know that there are epigenetic mechanisms by which nurturance impacts brain development. Of course, this is really where the rubber hits the road with the interaction between the psychosocial environment and biological brain development. So, I mean, as has been beautifully articulated by Mimi and colleagues, we know that in this animal work, maternal nurturance is actually shown to impact gene expression, and then gene expression, of course, impacts neuronal growth. And this has been demonstrated demonstrated through animal models where rats who engage in high nurturing behavior, which is evidenced by high licking of the offspring, the licking results in demethylation and receptor proliferation, and then those offspring have larger hippocampi, better stress coping, and importantly, um, are also more nurturing to their own offspring. So when I look at this slide, I think, could there be anything more important to our society than this phenomenon. So we've had an opportunity to, to take a look at some of these issues um, in a longitudinal study that we've been conducting for about 15 years now, which we call the Preschool Depression Study. And this study was launched um, really with the initial aim of addressing the question of whether children under the age of six, particularly we were focusing on three to six-year-olds, whether they could have a clinical depressive disorder. At the time, there was broad 
skepticism about that, as, as you well know. It really wasn't until the 1980s that people even accepted that children um, at school age could have depression. Um, so we conducted a study where we screened a sample from the St. Louis community using a screening checklist. We oversampled children with symptoms of depression. We included children with symptoms of other disorders, and we also included children who were healthy. We then wanted to address the question of of whether children ages three to six could manifest depressive symptoms, whether those were different than children who had other psychiatric disorders, and whether that was different, importantly, from just the normative extremes of sadness or irritability that we sometimes see in early childhood. And that's actually been one of the real quagmires in infant preschool mental health, given the, given the broad emotional expressions that young children have, there was a great deal of skepticism that, you know, these weren't just transient problems that children would grow out of. Well, to summarize, what, what we found was that, yes, there was a specific syndrome of preschool depression that was different than kids with anxiety. It was different than kids with externalizing disorders. These kids had um, relapses and recurrences over time, and they had homotypic continuity. So they went on to have further later episodes of depression. They didn't become kids with ADHD. They also, generally speaking, didn't sort of normalize either, although certainly some kids did recover. Um, and we published a lot of that literature, and it was still met with a great deal of skepticism, um, I'll have to say. It wasn't until we started doing studies, we started doing neuroimaging of the study sample that the game really changed. Um, and when it changed in my own Department, I know it would change in the rest of the world. So um, with my collaborator and partner in crime, Deanna Barch, we began to conduct brain scans in the study sample over time. Um, we've completed three waves of brain scans, and all that data is processed, and we're, I'll show you some of it today. We're con continuing to publish that data, and we're now embarking on, the, on another two waves of brain scans in the study sample. And the, the bottom line, is that it wasn't until we showed that there were alterations in the structure and function of brain in children who had had this preschool onset depression that were parallel to those that are known with adult depression and adolescent depression that people finally began to believe that this was an important phenomenon and it required early intervention. But to, to stay on the slide for a little bit longer, so what we were most interested in was sort of following the course of preschool depressives as they grew and developed over time, comparing them to kids with other psychiatric disorders, comparing them to kids with normative development. But importantly, what we would do is bring these kids into the lab. We did a lot of observational assessments of parent-child interactions, of, of child reactivity to various types of incentive events. We also, of course, looked a lot at the family environment. Um, and because of that, even though we've been most interested in depression, the study sample has revealed a lot of interesting secrets about the early effects of the psychosocial environment on brain development, which I'll tell you a little bit about more today. So one of, along that line, um, because we were so focused on parent-child relationship, because anyone who, who, who is in infant preschool mental health focuses on that because um, there's no such thing as a baby, as Winnicott would say, that, the, that the, the child is intimately dependent upon their primary caregiver. And for that reason, to really understand the adaptation and functioning of the young child, you have to assess the parent-child relationship. So we have multiple observational measures of parent-child relationship. And what we found when we looked at scan one is the children who had had high maternal support during the preschool period had much larger hippocampal volumes at school age, similar and perhaps parallel to the animal data that I showed you. 
Um, and then since then, there's been a lot of data that's been published just looking at the importance of parental nurture and sensitivity and attunement on child brain development, even in normative samples. In fact, this measure of maternal support or could be caregiver support has proven so robust in the study sample that my neuroscience collaborator, Deanna Barch, has said she will never do a study of neuroimaging without measuring parent child relationship and that's one of the most gratifying things I've experienced in my career yet. Um, so just to turn to some other aspects of um, brain development and the effects of the psychosocial environment, over the last five years in particular, there's been a great deal of interest of the effects of adversity, poverty, psychosocial stress on brain development. And a number of groups have looked at this and shown very clearly that um, children who are exposed to psychosocial adversity as evidenced by living in low socioeconomic environments have very different trajectories of cortical gray matter. Those children who are ex exposed to low socioeconomic environments have a much a flatter steep, uh, flatter slope of their gray matter development compared to those reared in high socioeconomic environments. And importantly, there's similar findings looking at surface area of brain as well. So we also took a look at this in our study sample because as I mentioned, we were, of course we were measuring things like income to need and parental education and those types of things largely as a control variable because we needed to account for that when we were looking at the effects of depression. What happened is that when we accounted for that, the effects of this variable was so robust that we started to chase it down a little bit more intensely. And what we've shown is that Children who were reared in income to needs, or um, this is in how the federal government defines poverty, how much uh, income is coming in and how many people have to share in that income. Of course, the federal poverty level is actually set at a very, very low level. So people living even a standard deviation or two standard deviations above the poverty level many times are effectively living in poverty depending upon you know, where they live. But basically we've shown that income to needs impacts the volume of the hippocampus and that wasn't necessarily new news. But what was new news is that this effect was mediated by maternal support. So while, you know, we'd all like to solve the problem of poverty, that's a pretty big, a tall order. But if we can begin to unpack what the mechanistic mediators are, then we can more specifically target um, how how we can intervene in a more streamlined fashion. So another thing that people look at when they look at the effects of adversity on brain development are, of course, income to needs. But another thing that has been really interesting, and of course that some of the, this research started at Kaiser in California, is the powerful effect of what are called ACEs, Adverse Childhood Experiences. And as you know, I think it was in the late 70s, um, Folletti and colleagues published data showing that people who are exposed to high adversity early in life life um, have very poor health outcomes and poor mental health outcomes. Actually, that data was published, I think, in the late 70s and really has not received the, the attention it deserved until more recently. I mean, and again, I think it has to do with the, the need to have tangible biological markers of these things. And while that finding was out there, um, we really haven't understood what the mechanism of that effect is. So one of the things we started to look at and we're really chewing on quite a bit right now, is looking at ACEs in our study sample. The ACEs variable is made up of exposure to poverty or income to needs, the number of traumatic life events, which we've been collecting prospectively over the 15 year period, parental mental illness, which is part of ACEs as defined by Coletti and colleagues. So that means suicidal ideation, substance abuse, or other access one disorders. And then what we did is we took a look 
at the effect of ACEs on frontal cortical volumes because this would, this is where the literature tells us to go. This is where the effect of early adversity has the most impact. And basically what we found was in, it, when we, when we um, apply multiple comparisons corrections, the area that stands out and survives those is the inferior frontal gyrus. So this is the region that appears to be the frontal cortical region that appears to be most impacted by the experience of early childhood ACEs. Um, and then this just sort of shows you what the data looks like on that front. So we've been very interested in exactly how this might be a mediator of some of the well-known effects of ACEs on later poor health outcomes. And this is just something that we've begun to dig into right now. In fact, I'm going to show you some data that is not peer-reviewed that actually we just generated on Friday before I left. But um, so we know ACEs impacts the volume of the inferior frontal gyrus. The inferior frontal gyrus, um, I've, I've, I've been searching the literature on sort of trying to understand its function. And of course, everyone, there's a well-established literature showing its role in inhibitory control and to some degree in related emotion regulation. Although, like, as I'm discovering, as I'm working with neuroscientists, the function of most brain regions really is very, very poorly understood. Um, so the question is, um, what we found is that ACEs impacts the volume of the inferior frontal gyrus. That is also associated with poor emotional awareness, and this is all sequentially, sequentially measured. Um, and then that relates to depression severity. And so what we have is a sequential partial mediation model. ACEs is leading to later depression severity. It's related to later depression severity, and it appears to be mediated by a decreased inferior frontal gyrus volume. That results in children who are much less aware of their emotional states and unable to express their emotional states, and that appears to lead to higher risk for later depression severity. It's not a complete mediation because you still have an effect of ACEs on later MDD severity, but, it, but it, some of the effect is through these mechanisms. So it begins to suggest some understanding of the mechanism of early adversity on later poor mental health outcomes. Now similarly, I was actually going to show this a little bit later, um, we also took a look at a similar model looking at global physical health outcomes in this study sample. Keeping in mind, this is a study sample that was recruited, remember, largely for having high rates of depressive symptoms early in life. Some had other psychiatric disorders, some were normal. We actually excluded children with chronic and serious medical conditions. But of course, as we've been following the sample over, the, over time, many kids do acquire medical conditions, and we see a very similar mediational model here. I'm going to explain later um, some theoretical work that has looked at the effects of ACEs on inflammatory processes and that these inflammatory processes may be what leads to poor global health outcomes later. Um, all of these things related to adversity and low income to needs. So on another front, my colleague Deanna Barch has taken a look at poverty and brain connectivity. Most of the work that's been done on the effects of poverty on brain development has looked at structural outcomes. This was, um, she published this paper earlier this year, and she was looking at networks related to emotion regulation. So she looked at um, the positive network um, between the hippocampus and other regions important for stress reactivity, um, hippocampus and amygdala, and she also looked at um, some negative regions between the amygdala hippocampus and other um, cortical areas um, of controlling emotion reactivity. What she basically found um, was that looking at the same study sample, she effectively measured income to needs at time one. Um, so we looked at the level of poverty children were experienced, experiencing. She looked at uh, functional connectivity at scan one between these negative networks and positive networks. And then she looked at depression um, at 
at scan one as well. And basically what she found is that um, the connectivity between the amygdala and hippocampus and these cortical control regions was impacted by income to needs and that this mediated the risk of income to needs and later depression severity at the time of scan. So one of the first findings looking at alterations in connectivity um, related to income to needs and it as a mediator of the relationship between income to needs and later risk for depression. Okay, so the other thing, I mean, as I mentioned, the main thrust of the study that we've been doing has really focused, of course, on early childhood depression. We got kind of distracted um, and now are very invested in this issue of exposure to adversity, poverty, and ACEs. But um, what we were originally most focused on, and of course we remain focused on it, is the effect of um, depression in early childhood on later brain development. And I guess the reason why this is so important, I mean, I do think it's important, but I, it's, it became even more important to me once I see how much more this moves the public health than when we look at psychosocial outcomes. I don't really think that that's valid, but it's true. So um, that's kind of why we've been very, very focused on the brain outcomes. So one of the things we wanted to take a look at, since we've had the opportunity to have this prospective follow-up, is we basically looked at kids' mean depression severity score over the first five waves, which is sort of between the ages of about three and seven. Um, and we, we measured depression using the semi-structured diagnostic interview, the PAPA. It was designed by Helen Egger and colleagues at Duke, and it was really one of the things that catalyzed the field because it allowed, it, it asked age-appropriate developmentally adjusted questions to access symptom status. So this will give you a full diagnostic profile on, on young children. Um, we, did a, we, we looked at the early depression load that these children were experienced, and then we looked at volumetric outcomes over the first three scan waves. So we're not just looking at one outcome, we're actually looking at how the brain is changing over these three scan waves. We were interested particularly in gray matter development. I've already shown you some data um, showing that gray matter development was very much impacted by several psychosocial factors. So really what we're asking is, is how does the exposure to being in a depressed state when you're a young child, how does that impact the way your brain develops over middle childhood and early adolescence. I mean, it's fundamentally the question of an experiential driver on brain development. And so what we know about gray matter development is that it's characterized by an inverted U-shaped curve. Gray matter is developing, volumes are getting larger um, at about early adolescence, and then pruning starts taking place, and gray matter volume is getting smaller. There have been several really interesting findings in the literature on the relationship between gray matter volume and thickness in depression and other mental disorders. We know in geriatric depression that there's widespread reductions in gray matter um, in, geri in, in older individuals who are depressed. We know that there's widespread cortical thinning in the high-risk offspring of depressed relatives. It's been detected in childhood onset schizophrenia and the famous paper by Shaw and all that showed that there was a delay in cortical maturation in ADHD. So we know that the maturation of gray matter is an important issue and we suspected it was going to be altered in our preschool depressives. So given the multiple waves of data that we had, we used multi-level modeling of this data. And in order to do that, um, we basically are looking at the effects of certain variables on gray matter volume over time. In particular, we're interested in MDD severity, but we wanted to control for income to needs because we know that this is very important. We want to control for IQ. We always control for gender because there are huge gender differences in brain development. And basically what we find is that um, depending on your level of depression severity in early childhood, those children who have higher depression severity have a different trajectory of gray matter development across the three waves of scans. In other words, those that have high depression, and we're looking really at the other side of the U 
U-shaped curve in terms of when our scan waves are occurring. Those who experience high depression in early childhood have a much steeper drop-off, or we might suspect greater rates of pruning than those who have low depression in early childhood. To us, this suggests the experience of early childhood depression is materially impacting brain maturation. Another reason to say, don't worry, not to say, don't worry about it, they'll grow out of it, they're only a little sad when they're young. Um, we have the same effect when we look at cortical thickness using the same type of modeling. So the way we interpret these findings is that early childhood depression experience, we believe, is associated with the change in the trajectory of cortical gray matter volume and cortical gray matter uh, thickness. The question is, is this an experience-based phenomenon or is it related to a genetic predisposition? Um, however, there was, no there was no effective family history of, of MDD, suggesting it may not be related to a genetic predisposition. Obviously, that's not definitive here, but it certainly lends more weight in the direction of our interpretation. And there was no effect of other psychosocial stressors. So we do think it was specific to the experience of early childhood depression. So what I would say to, to that is, you know, the way I would explain that to my grandmother is, um, young, young children who are de experience high levels of depressive states, um, the experience of all of this negative affect is fundamentally bad for your brain. And therefore, this is the reason why we need to pay attention to it and intervene in this domain. So the other thing that we've been really interested in, as I mentioned, is this effect of early childhood maternal support. In this particular study sample, something like 94% of the caregivers were mothers. But, I mean, we do think that this is generic to caregiver. It could be a grandmother, it could be a foster parent, it could be a father. And I previously showed you that like that animal model, children in our sample who experienced high levels of maternal support had larger hippocampal volumes at scan one. So what we then wanted to look at is how does this impact the change of the hippocampus over the three scan waves? Um, and what we know about hippocampal development is it's fundamentally on an upward trajectory, unlike gray matter, which is an inverted U-shaped curve. So these are just healthy subjects um, looking at age and sex and showing hippocampal volume increasing over time. What we wanted to do is we wanted to see how hippocampal volume changed as a function of early childhood maternal support. And what we found was an effective time. That is, children who experience high levels of maternal support, and remember, this is an observational variable. It's not just mothers coming in and, and rating their own parenting. It's blind raters rating the parenting in the context of a mildly stressful scenario. So this is one of the reasons why we think this data point's been so powerful. Basically, what we see is that hippocampal volume changes over time as a function of early childhood maternal support and that this remains significant even when we account for the effect of income to needs, IQ, whole brain volume, age and gender. So what this tells us, the things that we learn from this analysis, income to needs we know has an effect on the volume of the hippocampus, but it doesn't have an effect on change over time. IQ had an effect on the volume of the hippocampus, but it did not have an effect on change over time. Gender has an effect on volume, but no change over time. And then actually I'm going to talk a little bit about this a little bit more later, but, but the idea was is that maternal support experienced during the preschool period is what predicted change in hippocampal volume over time, not maternal support at school age, suggesting there was a sensitive period. So this is just what the modeling of the MLM looks like. Um, people who had low maternal support are the blue line. People who have experienced one standard deviation above the mean of maternal support during the preschool period are the green line. And of course, we want our kids to be on the green line. <laughs> 
So this is just a schematic kind of suggesting maybe this is the same phenomenon that Meany and colleagues have illustrated so clearly in laboratory animals. But something about maternal support seems to impact the growth of the hippocampus. And not only does it impact the growth of the hippocampus, it even impacts its trajectory over development, which is tremendously important because, of course, the hippocampus is a hugely important structure for adaptation, cognitive functioning, and emotion regulation. But that also leads to, you know, a lot of the neuroimaging data gets published and we talk about this volume is big and that volume is small and there's increased reactivity here and decreased reactivity there. And, you know, the truth is we're really not exactly sure what that means. So I think we have to hold our feet to the fire to say, well, these kids had larger hippocampal volume, had, had better, had steeper hippocampal volume growth trajectories, but why is that important? Um, and when we asked why is that important, we found that it was important because having a steeper hippocampal volume growth trajectory was um, associated with having um, decreased capacity decreased tendency to ruminate and better uh, emotion, uh, better sadness regulation. So it actually matters in terms of functional outcome, and of course that's what's really important. Now, I mentioned what we're also really interested in is this question of sensitive periods. And, you know, there are many, many elements of neurodevelopment where sensitive periods are well established and well understood. Certainly in, in the visual system, um, in language development. And I think the real question for us as mental health clinicians is are there sensitive periods in emotional and social development? And if so, this is just a tremendous opportunity for us to get more traction in the treatment of these difficult to treat psychiatric disorders. So because we've been following the sample over 15 years and we have repeated measures of maternal support, we wanted to ask the question of whether experiencing maternal support during the preschool period was somehow more important for brain development than experiencing maternal support later in life. Um, and luckily, we actually had enough variance in the sample where there, was, uh, there were enough kids who had high maternal support at the preschool period and lower maternal support at school age and vice versa to be able to ask this question. So what we did is we added that to the multi-level modeling and basically show that maternal support at the preschool period is the robust factor that is producing this change in hippocampal volume over time. Maternal support, and that, that survives even when we control for maternal support at school age, and maternal support at school age does not have the same effect, suggesting there might be something about if the experience of maternal support in early childhood is a particularly important ingredient for brain development. Um, and because the multi-level models are are sort of unsatisfactory. I just I just use repeated measures of novas here to show you that you know this is what the trajectories look like as a function of school age support. This is what they look like as a function of preschool support. So there really is a very big difference between these two variables and its impact on later brain development. So to conclude from what we've said so far, we know from the published literature and some of the literature from our data that I've shown you um, that poverty and early life adversity negatively impacts neurodevelopment. That's well established in animal models and it's increasingly evident in human samples as well. Um, we also know that early experiences of depression seem to negatively impact neurodevelopment and that there may be sensitive periods periods for these effects during which the brain is more reactive or responsive to environmental input. The next question is, how early in life can these effects be detected and therefore prevented? And we do have some evidence um, from colleagues at UPenn showing that the effects of poverty on brain structure are evidenced as early as one month of age, um, you know, suggesting not only early experience or experiential effects but also in utero effects or fetal programming effects. Um, 
So basically, we know that these things actually impact brain development in utero. I'm not going to show you that data today, but there is data from other groups showing that when pregnant women who experience high stress and adversity certainly have babies with poorer um, brain outcomes based on neuroimaging at birth, based on EEG at birth, etc. And of course, there may be sensitive periods for those effects. So another question that certainly needs to be tackled that we've begun that we're hoping to address is the question is what are the mechanism by which this process takes place so in a new um, uh, proposal and study that we're beginning to collect data on um, using some pilot funding um, we want to explore the effects of early life adversity the gut microbiome which I'm going to tell you a lot more about in a minute inflammatory markers and, and, and metabolism on early childhood brain development. So what we're doing is um, Washington University is part of a large multi-site March of Dimes study that is looking at the effects, uh, the causes of preterm birth. So at our site, actually at the end of this month, they're going to be studying a thousand pregnant women, many of whom are living in poverty and adversity. Um, and what we plan to do is to interview these women during each trimester of pregnancy to assess how much adversity and psychosocial stress they are experiencing, to um, use serum samples to measure inflammatory markers in these women's blood, to look at the gut microbiome of the pregnant mother, which is something that you do by collecting stool samples and then genotyping the stool samples, and there's a, a big body of researchers at WashU who are intensely into this. Um, wh what I learned is that um, certain types of people really get interested in that. Um, 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 it's actually almost as expensive. It's about as expensive as brain imaging, actually. Um, so it's, 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 no, it's, no, it's not for the faint of heart. Um, and then what we, what we plan to do is to image the babies at birth, um, follow them psychosocially over the first five years of life, and also conduct um, another brain scan when they are age two. Yeah, age two. So what the, the, the mechanistic model here is the idea that the pregnant mother who's experiencing stress, this impacts um, her inflammatory markers, which impacts her baby's developing brain. We suspect we will see differences in the brains of the offspring at birth. And then we will, we will look at the development of the baby's gut microbiome because the gut microbiome is well known to be very, very sensitive to adversity um, and stress, and that's been well studied. Um, and then see whether the theoretical model is really that stress causes alterations in inflammatory markers, um, and then these women are in a hyper-inflamed state that produces the same type of thing in the babies. That influences brain development, and the inflammatory response is also materially impacted by the microbial composition of the gut as well. So we're thinking that these are some of the mechanisms by which adversity impacts the biology of the growing fetus baby and impacts their brain development. Now, in a similar line of work, our collaborators on this study, um, Edith Miller and uh, Greg Miller and Edith Chen, have looked at something called the pro-inflammatory phenotype, and this is how they've explained the effects of ACEs on poor health outcomes. Or this is the theoretical model that they're looking at. They basically argue that children who are exposed to socioeconomic disadvantage or adversity um, basically have which is characterized by family instability, low nurturance, high conflict, high exposure to violence, poor nutrition, um, that these children develop what we call a pro-inflammatory phenotype. And they, of course, have, have evidence to show that this is the case. These children's inflammatory systems are sort of hyperactivated as if they're on alert. 
and but they stay in this hyperactivated state even when there aren't microbial invaders producing sort of like a state of low inflammation which is fundamentally bad for health and, and, and we suspect may be bad for brain development so they have this mild chronic inflammation they're resistant to inhibitory signals that's been demonstrated in humans using empirical data and they have these aggressive microbial responses this makes them very vulnerable to chronic disease and we also believe it may impact brain and make these children have poor impulse control and make poor health decisions which also contributes to these poor health outcomes so one question is how does the gut microbiome play a role in this and so this is you know a really new area in medicine that um, people that's developing a lot of traction right now um, and you know honestly I, I really learned about it for the first time when I met up with my collaborators at WashU the idea is that we all have um, this highly adaptable microbial organ in our guts um, and this microbial organ Organ is critical to the biotransformation of food into energy which of course is, is absolutely essential in the growing human it plays a key role in neurodevelopment and there's increasing interest in this which I'll tell you about more in a minute about the gut brain axis and how the gut is related to the production of neurotransmitters and the brain development importantly the gut microbiome is formed during the first two to three years of life as I mentioned it is responsive to adversity and it, it's sensitive to a variety of environmental exposures now thinking about the gut brain axis there's an emerging body of literature in both animals and humans showing that the composition of the gut microbiome is associated with behavioral outcomes so depending upon the composition of your gut microbiome and the different types of um, microbial systems that you have um, levels of depression and anxiety appear to be altered people who take probiotics that these have been shown to have some effect on and mood and anxiety and the mechanisms here are that the gut microbiome actually first of all impacts brain through direct the, the through the vagus nerve through the direct connection with the vagus nerve it impacts the production 90 percent of serotonin is produced in the gut it also of course very much is the stimulus for the development of the inflammatory system um, and I'm going to skip over this slide but uh, it's a, the, the gut microbiome importantly like these other aspects of brain development is highly sensitive to the environment um, women who are under stress have very different gut microbiomes and their offspring have different gut microbiomes it's related to to early feeding it's related to type of delivery of course it's related to antibiotic use um, but most importantly is the gut microbiome composition is very very sensitive to the psychosocial environment and to the experience of adversity so what we know is that um, the, there's microbial control of neural function by activating the immune system and immune signaling um, the microbiome exerts an influence on the regulation of neurotransmitters I just mentioned 90 percent of serotonin is produced in the gut the microbiome also influences amino acid composition of the brain and brain metabolism so one reason why we think this might be a very important um, early mechanism in neurodevelopment also there is a sensitive period for the effects of the microbiome on the brain and the microbiome is populating during the first two to three years of life this is just a slide that shows you that sort of brain development has this rapid center on the top you can't see it that well brain development is rapidly emerging in, in early childhood and the, and of course the field period and that's exactly the overlapping the time when the gut microbiome is, is congealing coming together um, so what are the implications for the risk and prevention of 
of mental illness. Um, it underscores the importance of early identification of mental disorders, um, the, the data that I've shown you so far, to capture enhanced plasticity or sensitive periods. It's the idea that we could harness experience-dependent plasticity, that is brain change that's sensitive to psychosocial environment, into therapeutic factors. Um, it's the idea that if we enhance stimulation and nurturance during these sensitive periods of brain development, we might be able to alter cognitive and affective development, um, given that we can change these targets more powerfully. Um, and then this leads me to some, a, a really interesting paper that was published about a month ago in JAMA Pediatrics, a longitudinal study looking at the effects of early intervention on brain development. This was a, a large sample study in the South um, where there was an intervention that occurred in the sample that was exposed to poverty. Um, and basically what they showed is that the kids who had the intervention um, had actual alteration Alterations, positive alterations in the development of the amygdala and the, and the hippocampus across time relative to those who did not have the intervention. This, I think, is the first data actually showing um, brain change related to early intervention that was based on enhancing parent-child relationship. So along the same line, we've been interested in studying this in our pre, in, in preschool depression. And to do that, um, we've collected, uh, we're, we're currently conducting a randomized controlled trial in a new sample of depressed preschoolers. Um, and we're conducting a parent-child interaction therapy and then trying to look at, of course, how this impacts preschool depression, but also looking at some neural markers. And the justification for that is that now that we know that depression can be detected as early as age three, I've also told you that those children who had depression at age three have alterations in the structure and function of their brain when we scan them at school age. It's the same types of alterations that we see in depressed adults and, and adolescent depressives. Um, my colleague Michael Gaffrey has also done some functional neuroimaging on acutely depressed preschoolers and shown some of the same functional brain changes both in reward response and amygdala reactivity in acutely depressed preschoolers. We know that in the course of depression there are genetic and psychosocial factors that influence the trajectory. I've just shown you lots of data underscoring the importance of psychosocial factors influencing brain development, particularly during early sensitive periods. So the question is, could early psychotherapy therapeutic interventions that target maternal nurturance and support and that are focused on emotion development, sort of a key developmental line for the prevention of affective disorders, um, be an important opportunity. And that's really what we're trying to look at in this randomized controlled trial. So what we've done is we took um, a well-validated, manualized form of therapy, which I'm sure you're all familiar with and probably is widely available here, parent-child interaction therapy, designed by Sheila Iberg. It's been studied since the 70s. It's got really powerful empirical support, robust effect sizes for the treatment of preschoolers with disruptive disorders. Um, importantly, I mean, we were compelled by this particular type of treatment because of the great empirical support, the large effect sizes, and importantly, because there are several studies showing that children who get this treatment during the preschool period, who are then assessed six years later without any booster sessions, retain their gains. So it's sort of this exciting possibility that it might capture some window of opportunity. Um, the therapy has a number of, of compelling features. One is that it um, is implemented using this teach, coach, bug in the air method. So basically, the therapist spends a lot of time um, coaching the parent in live, in vivo interactions with the child, some of which are sort of hot interactions. Um, let me try to go back to the other slide. And um, so what we did is we used these basic techniques of PCIT 
um, in collaboration and with the consent of Sheila Iberg, and we added on another module called the Emotion Development Module. So the treatment is fundamentally designed to enhance emotion development in young children. I really think of it as a developmental therapy. We use this in vivo coaching through the bug in the ear. Well, the other thing that's compelling about it is um, it teaches the caregiver to sort of function as the arm of the therapist, and it really sort of impacts caregiving skills, which we hope will endure throughout time. And then in the ED element, we use emotionally evocative events in vivo. So it sort of gets, you know, one of the problems with more standard psychotherapies is that people come into the therapist's office, they talk about what happened last week, maybe they distort what happened last week in their memory, maybe they're no longer feeling very emotional about what happened last week. What's nice about this is there's in vivo events that are happening in the here and now where the therapist can coach the parent. So what we're doing is a randomized controlled trial of this treatment. Basically, we assess, um, in order to do this study, we, I have to have a full-time study recruiter that runs around the St. Louis community to try to find depressed preschoolers, which is not easy because it's a disorder that has a prevalence rate of about 1% to 2%. So we have to do a lot of screening. We have to do a lot of educating. Um, we then do a baseline assessment, and then those children who meet criteria are either randomized to the immediate treatment or they're randomized to a weight condition, and both are assessed, and then after the weight condition, those people also get the treatment. So it does, it, it, it's worked well to enhance participation because everyone will get the active treatment. So what we also started doing was adding on an ERP and an fMRI in the sample at baseline. The ERPs are going absolutely beautifully. Um, we do a reward task and an emotion regulation task um, with these preschoolers using ERP. We only do it in kids four and older. The study targets kids three to seven. We do a mid-study ERP because, because the PCIT people are very interested in whether just standard PCIT actually helps for the treatment of depression. And then we do an ERP and fMRI at the end of treatment. So, so to be honest, getting a lot of good fMRI data in the study sample has not been easy. Um, you know, we, we put these kids through mock scanning, and we actually have a pretty high threshold to put them into the scanner because most of these kids who are psychiatrically ill and have a decent number of comorbidities are unable to be still enough. Um, but we hope to have enough fMRI data to kind of combine that with the ERP data um, so that we can make more sense out of it. And this just shows you sort of some of the techniques of using the ERP, which is really proven to be highly feasible. Most of the kids enjoy it. We've had something like a 96% um, good data uh, retention rate. So just to, to get into conclusions and next steps. Um, so we know that poverty and other psychosocial, other physical and psychosocial experiences predict brain volume, whole brain volume, as well as hippocampus. We know that poverty and likely other physical and psychosocial experiences predict functional brain connectivity in regions thought to be critical for emotion regulation. These changes in connectivity are important factors by which poverty is associated with poor mental health outcomes. We know that maternal support mediates the effect of poverty on brain volume. Um, and we also know that there's evidence that psychosocial intervention um, alters this pathway. And so many different pe people are doing different kinds of studies building on these principles. One, the idea of income transfers, the idea of educational augmentation, or family support and parent-child interaction therapies. And this is, you know, I hope I've given you enough evidence to underscore why I think this is such a tremendously important and fruitful area. And this, just to sort of put icing on the cake, this is um, 
a slide that was um, created by Jim Heckman, Nobel Prize winning economist at the University of Chicago, who has basically done an economic analysis of early intervention and really asked the question of, in terms of dollar, what is the gain on the dollar for early intervention and intervention across development? And what he's shown is that intervention invested during the preschool period has a much bigger gain on the investment than intervention later in life. Perhaps what I see this is is sort of a bird's eye view of these principles I've talked about today about sensitive periods, the effect of the psychosocial environment, and the windows of opportunity for change. Um, and then this is just to thank the members of my lab who have carefully and, and patiently collected this data over the 15-year period. Um, and of course, my collaborator, Deanna Barch, who I, I would be lost without. All right, thank you, that does it. Time for questions and comments. Yes. Thank you. I mean, so, so the thing that comes to mind when you ask that question is the idea of adults who have mental disorders, who've experienced a lot of adversity, who have not been nurtured as children, um, and of course the work that Dr. Lieberman's been doing and Selma Freiberg did, looking at how it's possible to sort of uncouple that with how those adults then later parent their own children. Um, so I think given that that's possible, that kind of leads to some hope for these adults that, that you're working with. But granted, it's sort of like shoveling snow after three feet have fallen as opposed to, you know, when it's accumulating. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. So the question is, given the changes in our society and politics and the backlash against women, and that you're so lucky you're here in California protected from it all, because um, <laughs> I'm from a red state, um, you know, how you could imagine the mainstream media taking this information and saying women should stay home with their children. Um, and, you know, I, I've had the mainstream media distort lots and lots of findings, although I honestly have not come across that one yet. I mean, more what the mainstream media does with this stuff is they publish things like mother's love enhances child's brain, that type of thing. Um, but, I mean, of course the problem is, is that it's a more nuanced issue. Um, and the idea being, I mean, that gets back to the idea of a caregiver being able to provide the best care to their child when they are happy, fulfilled, stimulated, and satisfied. Um, and I think that there's probably lots of an independent you know, body of data that would support that. Um, so, I mean, hopefully the mainstream media will take this to underscore the importance of paying attention to early childhood, investing in early childhood. Of course, when you put dollars on it and pictures of brains on it, that's when people start paying attention to it. Yeah. Yes. Yes. 
No, it's definitely not an outmoded theory, and it's, of course, very, very, it is a good question. Oh, so repeating the question is the issue of attachment and how this sort of plays into this process. And, I mean, of course, the attachment literature is, you know, tremendous, and um, I have, a, you know, obviously that's really what, what catalyzed this attention to the importance of the parent-child relationship in a very rigorous, empirical fashion. I mean, we haven't measured attachment um, because it wasn't necessarily, there's really not a lot of evidence that attachment and depressive disorders sort of go together. I mean, I think of attachment as a very, very important element of, and a foundational element of a parent-child relationship, but it's not the only element of a parent-child relationship. So it just wasn't the thing that we thought was most important to measure in this particular study, and it's, if you measure it, you've got to spend a lot of time doing it, and you've got to be, so we, it wasn't a good use of our resources, but if, I don't think attachment, I mean, attachment is, is tremendously important, and there are, of course, a lot of studies, um, or at least one that comes to mind, the Bucharest Early Intervention Study that has looked at attachment and has looked at its relationship to neural development. So, I mean, that, that I think, goes parallel and in line with the things that I've been saying. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Yeah, we, we, cert we are actively coding the parent-child interactions and looking at child variables. But you're right, I think it always helps to show videotape because people do have a hard time conceptualizing what this looks like. So it's, it's a good suggestion. Yes? Yeah, no, I think that's a good point. It's one possible mechanism for sure. So the second question was about um, the trajectories and whether there is sort of an early maturational process taking place. And many people have described that in the sort of risk trajectory of a number of different mental disorders. And, and that certainly could be the explanation. Um, the first was about sort of um, dandelion kids versus orchid kids and kind of the inherent constitutional or genetic features of the child in terms of their risk or resilience with adversity, and absolutely, we are looking at that. We have genotyped the entire sample. Um, my colleague Ryan Bogdan, who's a neurogenetics um, person, has been has published a paper looking at kids with the serotonin transporter and showing that sort of differential susceptibility phenomenon with regard to depression. We actually are working on some data right now about um, the serotonin kids with the ser short arm of the serotonin transporter being being more vulnerable to ACEs, um, evidenced by their brain activa activation of the IFG. Um, so yes, there is evidence of that, and of course I do think that's an important underlying factor. The problem is I think to study those kinds of things, you need much larger sample sizes than what we have here. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> 
So what was, um, we actually use something called the waiting task that's commonly used in developmental psychopathology research. The um, parent and child are seen together um, the, in a room. An attractively wrapped gift is placed in front of the child, and the parent is given a stack of paperwork to fill out. The child is told they can't open the gift until the parent is done with the paperwork. So then the child, of course, is very anxious to open the gift, and we code how the parent either um, supports, um, reassures, or fails to, or is harsh and punitive in that circumstance. I see it as a lot like what happens when you come home from work and you're cooking dinner and your kids are wanting your attention and just how you manage that. We actually excluded kids who were preemies, although we, we uh, unfortunately, some kids, did, we do have a sort of late preterm group that um, one of my colleagues has published on, and we've looked at some of those effects on brain development and maternal depression. We haven't really looked at, um, we're trying to obtain growth records on the sample right now, because I do think that's quite important. Yes. Okay. Thanks. I don't know of any data showing that. Oh, the question is um, the, the finding looking at the importance of the of preschool maternal support on the trajectories of brain volumes, and if you miss that period, essentially, is it could it still be meaningful, worthwhile, and effective to intervene later? Um, and I don't. And, and would that could that still impact neural development? Um, I mean, I don't know of any studies that have looked at that, but I would strongly suspect that it would, just based on the efficacy of treatments later in life, just based on even you know studies looking at at neuroplasticity in adults and in and in geriatric patients. Uh, of course, there's there's this whole new area of work which I didn't talk about because it's sort of out of my sphere. The idea of of reopening sensitive periods using certain types of pharmacologic probes. So, I mean, I don't think that there's no hope for people older than six. <laughs> Even though they're really not that interesting, people older than six. <laughs> Right. I mean, um, I know that they account for it. They very, very carefully account for antibiotic use whenever they do this work. I'm not, I don't know of data that has linked that as a factor, um, but I suspect people are looking at that for sure. Yeah. All right. Thanks so much for your attention.